Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the contemporary service here at Broadmoor. Y'all stand in worship with us. We'll break down the walls and let love prevail and pour out your truth and teach us your ways, oh God. And teach us your ways, oh God. And all your sons and daughters reaching to our contemporary service here at Broadmoor. My name is Amber. I'm the worship leader of this service. If this is your first time joining us, we hope you have felt the warmest welcome this morning. I do want to address those joining us online. Welcome. We're going to continue to worship, but I want to invite you to say good morning to your neighbors, and we're going to continue to sing. Amen? Amen.
Yeah, but the light is shining through the darkness we hide. Yeah, but the light is shining through the darkness we hide. So come let it, and come let it, but come let it, and come let it shine. So come let it, and come let it, and come let it, come and let it shine. There's only one way. To wash yourselves clean So let the dirt fall and get out of your knees There are a million scars for every mistake Oh, but we are not chained to the secrets that we make So come let it, come let it, come let it, we we'll come and let it shine. So come let it, we we'll come let it, we we'll come let it, we we'll come and let it shine. Rescue souls from the darkness around. This is the battle of a time of a time now. We can't afford not to cry, not to cry out. Shake the earth from the ground, from the ground. Rescue souls from the darkness around. And whoa. This is the battle of our time, of our time now. Can't afford not to cry, not to cry out. Shake the earth from the ground, from the ground. Rescue souls from the darkness around. Amen, amen. Y'all may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. We'll get it dialed in here in just a second. So good seeing everyone. Welcome to Broadmoor United Methodist Church. My name is Donnie Wilkinson. I'm one of the pastors here. So grateful that you are with us, whether you're worshiping in person or online. Let me share with you a couple of real quick updates, uh, announcements about things that are going on. Are Women Making a Difference, which is uh, an incredible group of women. They come together to do crafts that are not just to make cute things, but things that actually share God's light and love into the world. They, they make uh, note cards to send to the veterans' home. They, they repurpose uh, uh, Christmas cards to, to go to people who are overseas. They do all sorts of incredible, incredible things. They meet. Uh, their next gathering is going to be Wednesday, October 2nd from 9 a.m. to noon over in the Adult Education Building. If you would like to laugh and have fun and be creative and show God's love with the world, this uh, is a great organization for you to be a part of. Just drop by, check them out, and uh, have fun as you uh, creatively share God's love with the world. Our next yoga mass is going to be on the second Saturday of October. That's Saturday, October 12th from 1030 to noon in the sanctuary. Uh, this is a worship service that incorporates uh, yoga postures and breath work to help prepare our hearts and minds to meet Christ in the reading of the scripture and in the Holy Communion. And I encourage you to come and be uh, a part of that, to come check it out. Uh, you don't have to have any prior experience with yoga at all. Uh, it's just an opportunity to be in the beautiful space and to breathe and to feel the presence and connection with Christ. Um, and so I hope that you'll come and be a part of that. 
As many of you are already aware, uh, we're so grateful today to once again have Dr. Terry Ellis here for our Recovery Sunday. He brings a powerful word of encouragement and hope for everyone who is struggling with uh, addiction, whether personally is dealing with addiction or have a loved one that is dealing with addiction. Uh, and so we're, he'll uh, be speaking a little bit later in the service. And so we're so grateful that you're here for this message of hope and healing today. At this time, I'd like to invite the kids who would like to be a part of Kids Breakout, uh, age 5 to 5th grade, can go back and see Miss Andrea uh, in the back, and they'll come back into the service in, in a little while. There they go. Outstanding. Outstanding. As they are heading to Kids Breakout time, let's join together in uh, time for our prayer. So I invite you to turn your palms up in your lap. Close your eyes. Take a few easy, gentle breaths. And together, let us pray. And I invite you to begin this time of prayer with gratitude. Give thanks to God for three specific blessings that you are conscious of and grateful for this morning. I invite you to pray for three people that you know. Ask God to bless them, to fill their lives with hope, with healing, with joy, with love, and with peace. I invite you to allow the Holy Spirit to help you review the past 24 hours and to ask for forgiveness for specific mistakes or sins, places where you missed the mark, and ask for the strength to forgive others. I invite you to pray for one person that you have a hard time getting along with. Ask God to give this person insight into their personal problems and to give you the strength to let God's love flow through you to them. I invite you to ask God for sensitivity to the needs of one person that you can show God's love to in word or deed today. I invite you to ask God for help with your personal problems. I invite you to ask God for help in making progress toward your goals, to see the next faithful step and have the courage to take it. And I invite you now to ask God this question and to listen carefully for God's reply. Lord, what do you want to do through me? Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for a few moments of peace in a world that is so filled with chaos. We thank you for a few moments of connection with you when so often we feel uh, so far apart. Hear us now. Hear our prayers, for we offer them to you in the name of your son, Jesus, and together, all of God's people said, amen. amen. So in just a few moments, we will continue with our worship through the giving of our tithes, gifts, and offerings. As you're preparing for that, I'd like to invite Christy Rangel, if she will, to come to share uh, a very important, very moving ministry moment for us today. Hello. <laughs> so I spoke um, at 9 o'clock and cried through the whole thing, so I'm going to try to do better today. Um, 
So I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to speak today on Recovery Sunday because my family has been touched by addiction several times, but none as deeply and as devastating as my 21-year-old son's drug and alcohol addiction. My son Jackson was just 14 when he was arrested and expelled in ninth grade for selling his own ADHD medication at school. The next several years included drug use, suicidal ideation, psychiatric hospital stays, and finally an intervention when he was 17 and was arrested for DUI. That intervention was almost exactly four years ago, and Jackson has just completed his fourth rehab stint with 60 days of treatment in California. We are incredibly proud of him for seeking help as usual, but as usual, we're cautiously optimistic. It gets harder to have hope each time we go through this. So today is Recovery Sunday, but it's not just the addicts that need recovery. The loved ones need it too. God has shown up in so many ways while we've traveled this rocky road from being introduced to Dr. Terry Ellis, who's gonna speak in a minute, as we were planning Jackson's first intervention, to feeling the Holy Spirit as I've wept at the altar, having communion here at Broadmoor, to friends lifting Jackson and our family up in prayer. We've experienced other moments that show God's hand is in all of this too. We have met so many wonderful people in the recovery community from Tennessee where Jackson first received treatment to here in Baton Rouge to California where he'll be staying for sober living. These people will drop everything to counsel us when we reach out because Jackson's addiction has taken a darker turn. Through it all, they have shared how God's love and grace has helped them and their families recover from this horrible disease. <clears throat> when Jackson blocked us from all communication and social media last December, I went into a tailspin. He was in California and I had no idea from day to day if he was alive. This went on for two and a half months. My faith and relationship with God was at its lowest, so much so that I didn't even pray for my son anymore. I started therapy to deal with the anxiety and grief of a relationship lost, and my therapist suggested I start journaling, and we made a plan for me to journal every night for 15 minutes. This started me on a road back to my faith and being more prayerful. Many of my journal entries have turned into prayers and I started reading an Al-Anon devotional. I still journal almost every night and end with a written prayer, and I wanted to share a recent entry with you. This is from this week. Read some sad news this morning. A young man who has struggled with addiction lost his life in the desert in California. Brings up so many fears about Jack and his addiction and him being so far away in California. Jack leaves northbound tomorrow with 60 days under his belt. This is the longest he's been sober, sober in at least a year, but probably longer. He's going to sober living in Orange County. Sounds like a good program, but so did San Antonio, which is where he was a year ago. It's all up to Jack now. Just spoke to him for two minutes. He sounded good, said he's nervous and excited about tomorrow. God, please wrap your arms around Jackson and don't let him go. Keep him safe and protected. Lift him up and keep him clear-minded. Help him stay the course in striving for sobriety. Send angels and guides to watch over him and let him know he is so very loved. Amen. Now, I'm not an expert in addiction or recovery, but I want to offer myself to anyone here that may be dealing with a loved one's addiction. In the six plus years, in the six plus years we've been going through this, it's been helpful to know I'm not alone. And I'm so excited for Terry Ellis to be here today and share his message. My son met Terry at our last recovery Sunday and was energized after hearing him speak. 
I hope you feel the same when you leave today. Thank you, Christy. So as many of you know, uh, one of Broadmoor's primary outreach ministries is that we host uh, a dozen or more 12-step recovery groups of all kinds through, through the week. And we're only able to do that because of your incredible generosity. And so just know that whenever you are giving a gift, you could be helping to provide the space for somebody to take that first step towards the road to being healthy and whole and finding freedom. And so I just wanted to say, simply say thank you for that. At this time, I'd like to invite those who are assisting with the offering this morning, if they will make their way forward. And as they are coming forward, let us pray. Gracious God, thank you. Thank you for a church, being part of a church where we can uh, be a part of your healing work in this world. Bless these gifts. Multiply them for we give them in Jesus' name. Amen. don't have a job, don't pay your bills, won't buy you a home Beverly Hills, it won't fix your life, in five easy steps. Great pleasure.
to once again welcome Dr. Terry Ellis to Broadmoor. Many of you know Terry, many years of being a pastor here in the community, uh, and over the last several years, God using, uh, using his life to help so many lives uh, take that first step towards freedom. And so, Terry, we're so grateful that you are with us this morning. Come bring us a message of hope and healing this morning. And good morning again, Broadmoor United Methodist Church. Good to be back with you. Uh, this is my third time speaking to you, and I've done uh, luncheons and Sunday school classes and all, so I consider you to be one of my families, and I very much appreciate that. Many of you know my story. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into it today. I was 53 when I began to drink, and that's not a, I didn't misspeak. I didn't uh, just kind of drink low level and then ramped it up at age 53. I didn't start till I was 53. And um, had some things go on in my life, uh, family issues and, and other issues. And I began to be disappointed, and then I sank into depression, and then I sank into despair, which is one of the devil's greatest tools. If he can make you lose hope, you may turn to anything in order to try to feel better. Well, I turned to alcohol, and it got a hold of me very quickly. I went from having alcohol as a solution that kind of helped me sleep and take the edge off, which a lot of us will say that's what it does. So it helped me for a while, then it helped me with some problems attached to it, and after a while it was just problems. And I was as resistant to changing as anyone could possibly be because I had really given up hope of ever feeling better again, and this was the only thing that kind of made me feel normal, but I had redefined normal to mean a low level of existence that was hardly life at all. Eleven years ago, someone came to me at Broadmoor United, Broad, Broadmoor United Methodist Church, Broadmoor Baptist Church, part of the, uh, the Broadmoor franchise in this area. Uh, Dr. Leon DeMint came in my office and said, Terry, we need to get you well. And I knew what he meant. Uh, I felt I had been caught. I felt guilty. I felt ashamed. Uh, there was no fight left in me. He just said, and he could tell. He said, just do what I tell you, and let's go see a doctor that I choose. Not, not the one I'd been going to. It was just writing scripts and not taking any notice of the fact that I, I told him I, I started drinking. Is that a problem? He didn't mention it. And you shouldn't be drinking on the medications I was taking. Uh, interestingly, that doctor died of alcoholism a few years later. So he was kind of reluctant to confront one of his patients with something that he was dealing with as well. You understand what I mean? That's the nature of the disease. It's so irrational. I went to treatment, um, stayed for 90 days, or 92 days actually, and uh, came back and I have been sober since because I continued to live one day at a time and do the kind of things that I was told in treatment. If you do these things every day, I've never seen anyone relapse. And that's true. Uh, recovery is not complicated. It's not easy, but it's not hard. It's not hard in the sense that I can't understand. No, no, it's uh, very, very straightforward. In fact, I would sum it up like this. If you'll pray, read what we call the big book. And when I got into treatment, they said, okay, here's the big book, the Alcoholics Anonymous. Said, here's the big book. I said, I thought the Bible was the big book. And he said, he said, that's the big, big book. This is the big book, though. This is the one that you'll need. So I read that. And uh, so uh, pray, read the big book, or read some kind of literature that reminds you, Terry Ellis, that you are in recovery. Read that every day. Uh, go to meetings. Stay in touch with a sponsor, people in recovery. And then the fifth thing I'd say is just help somebody. Help somebody. It could be a, just a phone call to someone's hurting. But get outside yourself is the point. And my counselor, who at that time had, had 35 years' experience counseling alcoholics, said, I have never seen anyone relapse who does those things. And you talk to anyone who has relapsed, you say, all right, what's been going on in your life? Without question, they have stopped doing those things, some or all of them. All right, so anyway, that's kind of my story. I, I, I got into treatment, I came back, I was pat the church asked me to come back to their pastor, which was very gracious, they were very supportive. But within that kind of a two-year period, more people began to come to me and say, I've got a problem with drinking, or I've got a relative that's got a problem. What can we do? 
And I'd go as a part of my pastoral ministry and say, I think you need to go to treatment, so come on, let's go. And doing that just kind of developed. And I, a couple of years after I got out of treatment, I began chrysalis interventions. And this is what I do now. I speak anywhere I'm invited, and that includes colleges, uh, social work divisions, um, uh, addiction conferences and conventions, and uh, where it, uh, civic group, wherever two or three are gathered. I'll go and speak about my story and try to portray hope, as Christy said so beautifully. And your tears are not something to be avoided. They are a precious gift from God. The psalmist says that they are gifts of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit gathers them up. And I don't think there's anything more precious or more powerful than a mother's tears and a mother's prayers. So I pray for Jack as well. And I love you for what you did. I appreciate it so much. But that's what I do now. This is what I do. I go around and, uh, and speak to people and encourage them, share my story. And what a Recovery Sunday is all about is this. We're trying to pull back the curtain of shame and silence. Okay? And basically this, we're going to get into some of the theological underpinnings of this in a minute. If you are an alcoholic, I can say that's not your fault. I was born with a monster in my head. Okay? I did not know it. I was adopted at birth. I had no idea it was in my family history. Uh, but when I was 53 and took that first drink, it was like something grabbed a hold of me. And I, I, it's not that I couldn't stop. I didn't want to. And I could have gone a lot farther down. I would have killed myself. A few years ago, um, we found my, my family of origin. Now, both my father and mother had died. But you know what we found out? My mother died of alcoholism in 1989. My brother died of alcoholism in 2010. Grandfather. I had a cousin, an elderly cousin, uh, call me. He'd been doing drug and alcohol treatment for 35 years. He said, Terry, I used to drink with your mother every day. It's all through the family. So there was the monster. And I just didn't know. I was raised by good, solid Southern Baptist pastors in Lexington, Kentucky, which, do you know Lexington, Kentucky is a little different from South Louisiana? Are you aware of that? Okay. So it just was not in the culture. It was certainly not in our family. We just didn't drink. We weren't angry about it. We didn't look down at other people. We just didn't do it. When I did it, the monster was there, and it woke up. And I thank God for someone who came to me 11 years ago and said, we need to get you well. And one day at a time, I'm staying that way. And I get to come to you and say, if you are an alcoholic, it is not your fault. But once you know you are, it's your responsibility to do something about it. And to families, you didn't cause it, you can't cure it, and God knows, and you know too, you cannot control it, even though you keep trying. And what Christy said is so powerful and so, so very good. She went to treatment, you know why? Because she needs recovery too. So Recovery Sunday is not just about the alcoholics or addicts. It is about them, but they're not here this morning. They're hungover at home, Okay or they're not going to come and listen to a guy talk about addiction because they don't want to be challenged. But some of the family members are here today, and we want you to have hope. We want you to have hope. It's not your fault. You, can't, you didn't cause it. You can't control it. But you need to be in recovery, too. You need to get help. Get a good trusted counselor. Give me a call. I can help hook you up with somebody. You need to learn, and you need to develop some habits that keep you from being so on the, on the tension wire, when the addict or alcoholic in your life kind of plucks the string, it just makes you like this, right? There's a way for you to have the peace of Christ. So let's shift our emphasis. Let's look at that a little bit more closely. Let me begin with this story, though. About a year ago, I was in Lexington, Kentucky, my, where I was raised, visiting a lady who was in her 90s, Mrs. Whitaker. She is the mother of uh, two guys I was friends with growing up. We were just... You know, a bunch of us guys, that was one of the homes that we were welcomed in. And they were very, very kind to us, Mr. and Mrs. Whitaker. Uh, when I was in treatment, uh, she learned I was in there 11 years ago. She wrote me a note, a card rather, and it was just so nice. And over the years, I've kept up with her and visited with her and whatnot. Well, we were sitting there in her couch. On her, uh, she's on her couch. I'm in a chair in her house, ni nicely kept house, you know. And uh, she... At one point, we paused, and she kind of got tears in her eyes. She said, 
I never, never thought something like that would happen to you. Never, never, never. And I looked at her and said, well, Miss Whitaker, it kind of caught me off guard too. <laughs> Didn't see it coming. And what was she doing? It was something that's entirely normal and natural. It's a common mistake to assess the interior life of a person, how they're really doing, based on the external metrics. How do you look? Most of you look pretty clean, pretty good, you're nice. I have no idea what's going on underneath. No idea whatsoever. We tend to judge what's on the inside based on what the outside. Now, that's not all bad. Jesus endorsed that. He said, look at the fruits of the life of the individual. And you can probably tell what's going on underneath, right? Produce good fruits, it's a good person. But there are limits to that. The Pharisees were checking all the boxes. But in chapter 23 of Matthew, Jesus just goes over and over the fact, y'all are empty sepulchers. You're whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, but on the inside, you're falling apart. Now, again, it's not a bad thing to be able to try to assess how somebody's doing or how to assess how I'm doing based on what's going on. In fact, that's a good Methodist instinct. Uh, Methodism believes in the progress toward perfection, that grace forms us and continues to grow and shape us to a place where, in the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, you must be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Wow, thanks a lot, Jesus, right? My goodness. And people will come to me, my, I, I didn't say anything about it, but I, I have a doctorate in Greek, it's Greek New Testament. And I, I translate it more times, I just read it. I don't know how many times I've translated it, I just read it. So I'm very familiar with the Greek of the Greek New Testament. People will come to me and they say, what's the, what's the real meaning behind such and such in the Greek? And they'll come to me about this passage and say, what's the real meaning behind that you must be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. And I said, well, I'll tell you. The literal meaning of the Greek behind that phrase is you must be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Okay? I can't say to you, and I can't, Jesus did not let us off the hook, that the real meaning of the Greek here is you must be pretty good, especially on Sundays, as your Father is. No, that's not it at all. So we're supposed to be making progress in the moral life. And the Christian faith is about the renovation of the moral life through faith and through grace, the work of God, always initiated by Him, but our cooperation with Him. That makes sense. That's just good, solid, what we call soteriology, salvation uh, theology. That's it. But again, there's a limit. And this hit home with me as a pastor when I realized I can look out on a congregation. I have no idea what's going on, really. Because I was a pastor of a very large church in Mobile. We're on television, thousands of people. And, I mean, in the first couple of years I was there, we had a murder. A young couple, just superstars in our church, he murdered her. Uh, had a pediatrician, molest a child. Um, I, so many adultery, I couldn't, I needed a scorecard, try to keep up with that. Um, bank robber. I mean, just incredible things, you know, good. And they looked good on Sunday morning. <laughs> and I look at our congregation, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know, and I didn't really have much of an understanding that so many of them were struggling with addiction or struggling with somebody in their family who was addicted to drugs and alcohol. I just had no idea. And so I think that it can be said of all of us at certain stages in our lives, I never, never, never thought that would happen to somebody like you. No one can see the soul level disintegration that's going on here, the unraveling, the growing emptiness. And what do you fill it with? That's the key. What do you fill that emptiness with? And that takes us to the most important parable you've probably never heard of. It's in Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 to 45. Jesus said, When the unclean spirit departs from a man, he passes through the waterless places looking for a place to rest, but he finds none. Then he says, I will return to the house from which I was expelled. And he goes and he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Empty, 
swept and put in order. And then he goes and takes to himself seven other demons, more evil than himself, and they return to the house and inhabit it, so that the last state of the man is worse than the first. So it will be with his evil generation. You ever heard that parable? You talk about something that applies powerfully to our 21st century culture and a culture that's been with us for a long time and been developing for a long time. But that last line, so shall it be for this evil generation. And man, we get so uncomfortable when we start talking about evil. That sounds so judgmental. Jesus took it seriously. Okay? And I don't want you to think of evil or sin it's just some kind of puritanical thing where we're pointing out what's wrong with you what i'm suggesting to you is what the new testament is suggesting to us and it's this we all have a problem all of us and that's very important that i underscore that on a recovery sunday when i go and speak to a church it's not just to say feel sorry for all the addicts and alcoholics hope they get some help let's see what we can do to help them no it's for all of us because the thing that Jesus is talking about here affects everybody. And that little three-letter word, S-I-N, is such a roadblock to people, and it doesn't need to be. It's just, it's a deeply nuanced theological concept that describes the brokenness, the emptiness that all of us deal with. I heard a story of a priest, he was a young priest in seminary, and he was uh, brand new and felt really awkward in seminary. And he uh, went to the cafeteria one of the first days he was there. And he's looking around for somebody to sit with. He doesn't fit in. There's just older guys there. And people are coming in on sabbatical and studying. He just feels completely out of place. He looks at this older guy and he says, well, I'll sit with him. Guy ends up being from Eastern Europe. A priest over in Eastern Europe. So he uh, has come over to do some extra study and whatnot. So this young guy is saying, well, i got to find something to talk with him about, and the guy's kind of, he doesn't talk a lot, laconic type personality. So this young guy finally says, well, I got a question. He said, I, I, you know, what, kind, what piece of advice would you give to a young priest? So I'm straight for the priesthood. And the older guy thought, put down his fork, finished his food, chewing, chewing. He said this, sin makes us unhappy. Sin makes us unhappy. Substitute the word brokenness. What's breaking you? It's making you unhappy. And you may be trying to convince yourself, no, I'm handling it well. If people just get off my back about it. And maybe you're sitting there congratulating yourself. I'm glad I'm not having trouble with alcohol and drugs. I'm glad you're not having a problem with alcohol and drugs. What are you having a problem with? What's the brokenness in your life? What do you struggle with? What are you attached to that you find it difficult to get away from is it gossiping is it talking about others is it looking down at being judgmental that's a problem that's brokenness is it something that's a little bit more obvious is it a gambling problem is it pornography it's tearing up families tearing up men skewing the idea of what men and women are it's horrible is it eating too much is it exercising too much is it Amazon? <laughs> There's the daily offering shows up on my front porch. Well, there you go. <laughs> the <laughs> daily offering of Amazon. My wife takes it, brings it into the altar, which is the breakfast bar, opens <laughs> the offering from Amazon. But you see what I'm talking about? It, it, this is an opportunity, and I, I, I spend some time on this because it is uncomfortable, and we're supposed to make you uncomfortable, sometimes from the pulpit. There are things that we need to deal with, and we're not dealing with them. We just kind of cover them up, we make excuses for them, and we think we're pretty good. You look good on the outside, but you struggle on the inside. And I want you to pull that out and expose it to the light of the grace of God so that he can fix it and bring you along and make you more the man or woman he created you to be. Otherwise, we risk prioritizing the wrong things. We risk a heterodoxy, which is the praise of other things rather than God, you see. Swept, put in order, but empty. Empty of happiness? Yeah. And Christianity is the rational pursuit of happiness. Catch that. Christianity is the rational pursuit of happiness. 
It is thinking and living in the way that God intended you to think and live. And that creates a sense of peace in us and happiness. Is it empty of abundant life? The kind that Christ came to say, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. You live in abundantly? There's something standing in the way. You got to deal with that. Empty of meaning? Ah. Carl Jung wrote, Meaninglessness may be described as the general neurosis of our time. You wrote that in the 1950s. You think we're doing better? Don't underestimate the pop popularity of this wide and the wide impact of this kind of cultural acid. The idea that there really is no meaning, that we're just you know, products of science or whatnot. There's a book by um, a fellow named Yuval Harari. It's a very good book. I read it. Um, called Sapiens, A Brief History of Human Kind. It's fascinating. But in it, he has a section on meaning. He's just charting the development of human culture over tens of thousands of years. And he's a materialist, atheist. And in the section on meaning, he writes this. As far as we can tell from a purely scientific viewpoint, human life has absolutely no meaning. Humans are the outcome of a blind evolutionary process that operates without goal or purpose. Hence, any meaning that people ascribe to their lives is just a delusion. Ah. Be hopeful. <laughs> He's acknowledging that there's an emptiness there. And that mankind, we are meaning-seeking creatures. But he's giving us no hope that there's any meaning. And from his point of view, he's exactly right. So we try to fill up the empty space. With what? We have careers. We have 401ks. We have education. We have cert certification. We have accomplishments. But we're empty. We're swept. Put in order. Still empty. You know the most dangerous book in the Bible? is called the book of Ecclesiastes. And I say it's the most dangerous book because this is written by Solomon, purportedly, who's got all of this, wealth and relationships and, and education. He's smart, and he says, vanity of vanities. It's all vanity, and the word in Hebrew means emptiness. So he's got all of these things, and he's trying to fill that God-shaped void in his life. None of it works. And what we're doing today more and more is trying to fill that emptiness with drugs and alcohol. And it gives rise to the idea of the diseases of despair, suicide, murder, and overdose, and related the deaths of despair, which for the latest year we have the statistics, about 25,000 Americans committed suicide. 50,000 or so murdered. And the overdose deaths 200,000, and there's no way to say how many people died because of their alcoholism. Because if you died in a car accident and you were drunk, you died of an accident. Or you fell and hit your head and brain aneurysm, you died of an accident. You died of a fall. You see what I mean? There's no telling what that number is. It's hundreds of thousands of people died from this disease. And that doesn't count the number of people, literally millions, 25 million people in America today are living with some level of what is called in the uh, research substance use disorder. Some level, okay? 25 million people who are living in the shadows. St. Irenaeus said that the glory of God is a man fully alive. The glory of God is a man fully alive, which is a wonderful and thrilling thought, the idea being that if you live the way God wants you to live, if I become the man God wants me to be, it brings glory to Him and it brings great joy and happiness to me. I'm lined up, right, with Him. But if I deviate from what He's created me to be, sin makes me unhappy. My point being here with addiction and, alcohol is th uh, addiction and alcoholism is this. There are people that are living with disease daily, and they're living in the shadows, and they don't know it. They don't realize it. They resist it. They're going about their days with an incredibly unhealthy, perhaps deadly relationship with drugs and alcohol. One of my most common appointments, and by the way, 
you want to talk to me, I'm available. And I say, Chrysalis Interventions, my company, we have locations throughout Baton Rouge. They're CeCe's Coffee Houses. I meet a lot of people in CeCe's Coffee House. And you know what the most common question or the common issue they bring? It's usually men who come to me. Women too, though. Sometimes people about their spouse. But anyway, the most common question is, I think I may be drinking too much. Let me give you a clue. If you've gotten to the point where you've decided or you, somebody else has made you decide to call an interventionist to ask, I think I may be drinking too much or state I may be drinking too much, guess what? You're drinking too much, okay? So what do we do? And there are a variety of things that can be done. A variety of things. It's not easy, but it's not complicated. And if you'll do what I suggest to you, you will never have to deal with that shadow again. Never, ever again. You can be swept, put in order, and full of the grace of God. My point is this. Addiction, first and foremost, is a spiritual issue. It drains the spirit. You're allowing a drug to take the edge off. That's the peace you're looking for. It never stays. Jesus said, my peace I give to you. Not a peace that the world gives. Certainly not a peace that this gives. But my peace I give to you. A peace that passes all understanding. And it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And that applies to every situation in life. It is Christ that we need to fill the emptiness of our souls, to enlighten the dark corners of our lives, to go again and again and to, to get out those pesky reptiles that keep coming back and trying to get a hold of us. That's why you come to church on a Sunday, to remind you. And that's why you engage in the spiritual practices on a daily basis, I hope, to remind you and to gain access to the resources that God makes available to us. This broken generation stares into the abyss of its well-ordered emptiness. And it wonders where the answer is. We've got the answer. We've got the answer. Alexander Solzhenitsyn in his 1983 address um, gave a, a very central moral and spiritual critique of the terrible 20th century. He, these his words. Over half a century ago, he was born in the Soviet Union, 1917. While I was a child, over half a century ago, I recall hearing a number of old people offer the following explanation for the great disasters that had befallen Russia. They said this, men have forgotten God. That is what happened. Men have forgotten God. Since then, I've spent well nigh 50 years working on the history of our revolution. In the process, I've read hundreds of books, collected hundreds of personal testimonies, and have already contributed eight volumes of my own toward the effort of clearing away the rubble left by that upheaval. But if I were asked today to formulate as concisely as possible the main cause of the ruinous revolution that swallowed up more than 60 million of our people, I could not put it more accurately than to repeat, men have forgotten God. That's why this has happened. Men have forgotten God. And Recovery Sunday is all about somebody coming in and helping you remember. But you must be willing to talk about what's going on. Don't accommodate. Don't normalize those shadows, that darkness. Reach out. Families, again, reach out. Sometimes we can help. Sometimes we can't. But we can help you. And again, it's not your fault. You didn't cause it. You can't control it. You can't cure it. Get out of the addiction management business or the alcoholic management business. Have an intervention. Set firm boundaries. We can help you. We can help you and pay attention to your own spiritual welfare. A Recovery Sunday is that time when we pull back the curtain of shame and silence. And in a way, I say, yeah, this is what happened to me. And thank God, using some tools that he makes available to us, very simple tools, I'm a recovering alcoholic. One day at a time. And you can join me. And I hope you do. St. John Paul was in, uh, he was Pope in 1979. He was invited into communist Poland to speak there. And you see pictures of this, and there are literally millions of people gathered in this atheistic country to hear one of their own. He was from Poland, you recall. And he said, let the spirit descend 
and renew the face of the earth, this earth. And I would echo those words. Let the Spirit descend and renew this family and this community, this community. And let people know that at Broadmoor United Methodist Church, they understand us there, they welcome us there, and they can help us there. And the people in the audience at the behest and the prompting of St. John Paul, when he said, we need God, they took up the call. And they began to chant, imagine millions of voices saying together, we want God. We want God. We want God. Whether it is you person that struggles with some kind of addiction or whether it's a family member, there's your answer. You need God. Draw close to the Father that loves you and can give you grace. May God bless you as we all recover together. Thank you, and God bless you. So here's an opportunity to respond. Not by earning anything, but by receiving the invitation to come to this table a table of grace and mercy, a table of love, a table that shows the lengths to which God is willing to go to set you free from everything that would hamstring you. So let me just simply remind you, the night when Jesus gave himself up for us, he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Remember me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink this cup, remember Today is a fresh start. Today is a day of new beginning. So God, we pray that once again, you would let your spirit fall upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Let them be for us a real experience of Christ's presence. Let his healing power flow through us and let us be set free from everything that would keep us from being perfect as you are perfect. For we have gathered and we pray in your holy name. And together all of God's people said, Amen. Now